Hello, I'm Herschel York, Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and pastor of the Buck Run Baptist Church in Frankfurt. The Pastor Well Podcast is dedicated to helping servants of the Lord Jesus Christ be more faithful in ministry. We do that by simply engaging in conversation with significant uh, leaders who help us in our ministries, and today I have one that is a great help to me personally. Uh, a multi-talented uh, man, uh, Dr. Jimmy Scroggins. Uh, Jimmy, welcome to Pastor Well. I'm so glad to be here. I've been listening, and I'm so honored to get to be a part of it today. Well, uh, you know, the I'll confess that the the most fun and the easiest ones for me are with people I know. Right. And you and I go back pretty far. I guess I've known you... Late 90s. 23 years, yeah. yeah. I think when I first came... To Southern. So you were a student at uh, Southern Seminary. Now, there's an interesting history here to me. You you came really about the same time Al Moeller came to Southern Seminary, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. So Al came in the fall of 93. I came and visited the seminary in the fall of 93 and met Al. That's when I was convinced that God wanted me to, to go to Southern. And so I started at Southern in January of 94. And then I did a, an MDiv and then I did a PhD for extended period of time yeah well so you were there for an incredible transition i was prior to al moeller uh it it was known certainly by southern baptist as being uh liberal Uh, that's the word they they would have used the word moderate but uh, i mean what kind of things did you encounter in the classroom there you 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 came from jacksonville you had been under the ministry of dr jerry vines one of the leaders in the conservative resurgence and here you are at Southern Seminary, where at that point you still had a lot of faculty that were very much on the opposite side of the conservative resurgence. Well, I think the most remarkable thing when I came to Southern was, number one, everybody hated Al Moeller. And so all the students hated him. The faculty hated him. I mean, and when I say hate, I'm not using that. No, you're not. That, you're not. That, that, in that's the wrong not way. hyperbole at all. No, it's not because they these people were protesting against him. It was in the news every day. And so it was just a really kind of a strange environment for a guy who – you know, I majored in economics in college. I took notes on the sermons and so forth when I was growing up, but I didn't have any background in biblical or theological studies at that level. And so when I came to Southern, I was astounded at the vitriol. I was astounded at the politics. Uh, I wasn't aware, really, of Southern Baptist politics as a as a kid growing up in Florida. And so when I got there, I was just, I couldn't believe it. Um, when I went to class, there were, there were, people who are fascinating lecturers, but they began to open up a whole world of critical scholarship to me, uh, which I was simply unaware and really unprepared for. And so when they would say things like, hey, I remember one of my professors said, hey, if if, uh, archaeologists dug up the bones of Jesus and could somehow prove that those were his bones, it wouldn't change my faith at all. And in class, I said, just blurted out accidentally, not meaning to be disrespectful, I just said, well, heck, then you're not a Christian. And then I got thrown out of class and a bunch of other stuff ensued. And so I had arguments in class with professors and uh, people um, questioning the authorship of every book, the authenticity of every book in the Bible, really trying to um, undermine the faith of the students who were going to be pastors in the scriptures. And, you know, once you undermine that, you undermine everything. Right. And one of the benefits was since everyone hated Al Mohler and I liked him, there were only about five or six students on campus. I'm, I'm serious that really appreciated and respected Dr. Moeller. So I would go to his office a couple times a week and say, hey, here's what I'm learning in the class. I know that this is not right, but I don't know why it's not right. Can you help me? And he would assign me extra books to read and I'd come back and he actually would teach me through some of these early classes when I was at Southern and give me a, a better perspective and is extremely helpful to me. And through that, we built a strong friendship. And so it was really a blessing to be there at this crazy time. Plus, I got to observe a great leader turn an institution that many people said couldn't be turned. Yeah, that's right. It it it, it was unthinkable. It was. I mean, I, and that he could do it. Yeah. Uh, he was either going to kill it or turn it around. No, he yeah. told me that. You remember me? I think I've told you that story. When I went to uh, visit in the fall of... Um, of 93. And I went in his office to meet with him and I'd never seen him before. He looked really young to me. Um, he kind of looked kind of nerdy had those big glasses, yeah, you know, did. he just, and he, and 
And I said, Dr. Moore, I've been on this campus for two days. I've been in the gym. I've been in the library. I've been in the classroom. Everyone here hates you, and they are going to dig in. They don't want to do what you want to do. And I said, how are you going to, how are you going to, what makes you think you can turn this ship around? And he said, I promise you, with God's help, I will either turn this ship around or I'll sink it myself. And I thought, man, I don't know if this guy can do it, but I want to come be a part of whatever he's doing. Status quo was not, not an option. That's right. Yeah. You know, but I think God had specifically prepared you to be one who would come there alongside uh, Dr. Moeller. So uh, you had previously gone through some stuff. Uh, You, First of all, you went to West Point, right? I, I did. When I got out of high school. I mean, to get a West Point appointment is a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you had to be recommended by a congressman. That's right. And uh, you got the appointment So out of, out of high school. Right. And uh, tell us about it. Well, I'd always wanted to go to a military academy. So I wanted to either go to the Air Force Academy or to West Point. It so happened that through a series of events, West Point was the one that offered me a an opportunity first. And so I took it. Um, I went to West Point when I got out of high school back in 1989 and was going through basic training. And then they found out that I had cancer. And so I ended up spending a year or so doing surgery and chemotherapy and a bunch of other stuff. And so I was active duty in the army for two years, but really mostly I was in and out of hospitals and on uh, medical leave. And then I was honorably discharged. And so then I ended up going to, uh, Jacksonville University, which I affectionately call the Harvard of the South. Okay, you uh, you you pass over your discharge. Yeah, uh, you were discharged because you got cancer, right? And uh, you were how old? Seventeen. Seventeen years old. Yeah. And uh, what's it like to face cancer as a seventeen-year-old? Did were you terrified? I mean, what what did it feel like? Well. Um, I was an athlete, so I went there to play football. Um, honestly, as a 17-year-old kid, you feel pretty invincible. I kind of treated it like an injury. And I did have a moment. I, when I was 17, so I, I go to West Point. I'm there for about three or four weeks. They figure out that I've got this uh, testicular cancer. They fly me. They medevac me same day. They found out. They put me on a medevac plane from White Plains, New York, to Washington, D.C., took me over to Walter Reed Army Medical Center there in Washington. And so I'm there by myself as a 17-year-old kid in Washington, D.C. Wow. And that night, and the doctor said, hey, tomorrow we're going to do surgery because this is pretty serious, could be serious for you. And so I was laying there in the bed that night by myself, and I just got my Bible out, and I was reading through the Psalms, and it was like God just spoke to me um, and just, just affirmed in my heart that, you know, I gave my life to the Lord when I was a little kid, and God had me then. He had me now, and and I just had this impression that whatever was going to happen, God was going to take care of it, and it was going to be fine. Not healing necessarily. Even if I was going to die, either way, I just had this incredible sense of this is in the Lord's hands, and that really marked me. That was one of the, in my mind, one of the um, probably the, the biggest confidence builders in my life because I just had this sense and I have ever since that God has a, has a, has a plan that God has a perspective that God has power over even things that are beyond my control. And, uh, he's going to work out, um, good things for his kingdom. And I get to be a part of that. Uh, so a few liberal professors after facing that really wasn't that big a deal. No, I will say, <laughs> you know, I grew up in the home of a football coach. So I've been coached my whole life. I've been yelled at, I've been kicked in the rear end. I've, you know, um, I went in the army, they yell at you, they kick you in the rear end. So I go to seminary. Honestly, these guys were not intimidating to me. So <laughs> I just, uh, I, I mean, intellectually, they, they were my superior and certainly in terms of their study, but like, I wasn't afraid of anything that was happening right. in there. Uh, at what point did you meet your wife, Kristen? And, and yeah, marry so, her? well, I was in college, uh, after that, uh, got that cancer cleared up. Uh, I went to Jacksonville university and I was attending the first Baptist church of Jacksonville and I met her. Um, she was, she went to that church as well, but I didn't know it was a very large church. I actually met her in a restaurant and I saw Not her in a, a restaurant church, but in a restaurant. Yeah. I saw her in a restaurant and, uh, I, I thought she was very attractive and, so I went over and introduced myself to her and she wasn't honestly very polite about it. And she kind of, <laughs> you know, um, pushed me away. And 
but I worked at it for a while and finally got her to date me. And then uh, we ended up falling in love. And then, um, she finished college. I, I was in Louisville for a year while she finished college down here. And then we got married at the end of 1994 and moved to Louisville together. Uh, and, uh, how soon did you have children? Uh, she got pregnant about six months after we were married. So, um, we started having kids pretty early. Yeah. Well, one of the things about you that, that, uh, defines you in my mind is that, uh, you and Kristen chose to have a large family. Uh, yeah. how many children you have? So we have eight, we have six boys and two girls, eight children. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. The logistics of raising eight children has got to be challenging. Just like how, how you get everybody in a vehicle you had to so uh, how old was your oldest one when your youngest one was born well let's see uh, he was 13 so he's 23 now caleb's 10 so she so had eight in 13 years yeah and uh so how do people react to that well i mean it's unusual for most people and most people don't have families that large some people have larger for sure we have a couple of families in our church that have more kids than we do but uh, it is it is unusual. So you get comments, you get stares, and frankly, if you're going to have the larger your family is, um, you're going to do things differently than other people do them. So your your budgeting is going to be different. Your vehicles are going to be different. Your vacations look different. Your daily rhythms are different. Um, but it's what we wanted to do. We're grateful that God allowed us to have those children. We wanted to have those children, and uh, you know we take joy in it. It definitely does. Um, it just you just have to be okay not being like everybody else. Do you think more Christian families should do that? I'm reluctant to uh, say what other people should do. Um, I wish more people would do that. Uh-huh. I don't know that I would say that they should. You know, however many children you have, if you have one, you have two, you have five, however many you have, it takes everything you've got. And it takes all the money you have. It takes all the time you have. It takes all the energy you have. And so I just think God has a, a plan for um, for each family. Although I will say, um, I run into, I've, I've never actually heard anyone say we just had too many kids when right. their kids are grown. And I've heard many faithful believers say, wow, you know, if I could go back, we'd have had more kids. Tanya and I say it is our biggest regret and mistake in our marriage. Really? Yeah. It's, it's, it's number one. That's a statement. You know, yeah. we, we feel like we, yeah, we made that decision too early. We didn't know what we were doing. And I will say, you know, I think uh, people weren't talking about it then. Right. You know, and, and thank God for those that came along and sort of challenged Christians to think we were, you know, you were buying into this, the really the cultural norm of what you can afford, mm-hmm. you know, what you have time for. And I just look back at that now and go, yeah, that's all pretty self-centered. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, there's definitely some. Yeah, but I mean, we had some two. Some practical we realities. Had two. And, yeah. and I'm confident we could have afforded more and had time for more than two. And, uh, you know, we, we it is. It's our biggest regret. Well, I can see that. I, You know, uh, Kristen honestly would have had more. And so I kind of just, at, at at some point, I was like, hey, I, I don't know if I can you know, take joy and more, but, but honestly, she's probably right. And to this day, she would adopt them right now. You know, we had three foster kids live with us last year. I know. I remember and she loved every that. second of it. And, and if circumstances worked out that they needed to be adopted, you were, I remember you saying you were yeah. willing to do that. Well, and you know, um, I'd still say, I'm not sure. I'm not saying that we will do that at some point, but I will say that conversation is probably going to be ongoing from time to time between Kristen and me. Well, especially when Kristen initiates it. Well, I can't think of anybody that I'd rather see rearing children than you and Kristen. Well, Kristen's the key. I mean, the truth is, Kristen is the one with the grace. She's the one with the organizational ability, and she's the one who's able to pull all of this together and kind of hold it together. I mean, I'm very um, scattered. I have a hard time staying focused. Um, I'm hot headed. Uh, Kristen is just the the one that's stable. She's the one that is grace filled and mercy filled and kind and organized. And without her, I mean, John 15, five, you know, without her, I can do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. I, and knowing the two of you, I believe that. <laughs> yeah. <the way. laughs> you know it to be true. Yeah. Well, how do you keep your relationship fresh? I mean, you are now pastor of the family church, a very mm-hmm. historic church. 
it was formerly known as First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach. Uh, and it's a large church. So you've got eight children, two of them married. Yeah, two are married now. And you don't have, you don't have grandchildren yet. No, but I'm I'm It's a eager. game changer, man. I'm I'll ready. Just, I'll tell you, it, it's a game changer. And it really is true that there's something so different about grandchildren that yeah. uh, you, you sort of wish you'd started there, you know? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> uh, but how do you guys find time to keep your relationship fresh and you connected to one another? Well, one thing, uh, one thing we actually learned from watching you and Tanya all these years is uh, you and Tanya have so much fun together and just a parent. Yeah, and, and, and I've been around you enough. I've been in your home. We've been, you know, around enough that I know that it's genuine. It's not you trying to model something. It's who you are. And so we really learned a lot by watching you and some other folks. Um, and so we just try to really enjoy being together. And look, mar- we have a real marriage, so we don't have a, you know, a magic marriage. I mean, it's got its ups and downs and, right. and uh, for sure. But it, it, Kristen knows if there's one thing that I can do with my time, I'd like to spend it with her. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's one thing I could do on vacation, I would. My favorite thing to do on vacation is go somewhere just with her, and uh, and yeah. she says, "Well, what about the kids? I don't want them to come. I want to be just with her." Now we do take vacations with our kids, and I enjoy them too. Right, but, but my favorite thing to do, yeah, is be with her. Uh, the love of your children, as great as it is, does not really compete with your love of your wife. No, in fact. Uh, I learned that people taught me that early on uh, and that were discipling me and I actually took it to heart. So my kids know that everybody knows that, Hey, I love you guys more than anything in the world, except your mother. Yeah. And you know, that gives them a security. It does. This is, it, I know it's counterintuitive. People think, you know, they think it's a good thing to have a child centered home. It's, it's no. a terrible thing. You know, they they really, they get their security from seeing the relationship, their love between the mom and dad. That was like, yeah. things are okay because they love each other. Right. And uh, it also prepares them for the world. You're not going to be number one out there no. in everybody's life. And well, we laugh. We laugh because we'll say, I'll say, Kristen, listen, I want to eat a steak and I don't want to cook it myself and I'm taking you. We're going to eat a steak. <laughs> and she'll say, okay. <coughs> you want to take any of the kids? Nope. Well, what are they going to eat? I don't know. Peanut butter and jelly, whatever they got in there, tell them to figure it out. I'm going to take you to have steak. <laughs> so the kids, the kids just laugh and they're like, "Oh, I see how that is. Yeah, you see how it is." Yeah. Uh, so, you tell me about your church. Tell me about family right. church because I, I'm curious how you balance everything. It's a large church. It's grown. You you're reaching a different demographic, I think, than the church reached historically. So, explain all that. Um, well, our church, you know, First Baptist Church of West Palm Beach is a typical. Uh, downtown First Baptist, Southern Baptist church. It's uh, over well over 100 years old. It's uh, It's got a prominent address, columns, steeple, um, everything that, that you would think of. And historically, it really was a great church, had great days, reached a lot of people, had some great and famous pastors. Thank you very much. And, um, you know, Jess Moody, Jack Graham, and others. Um, that church started what is now Palm Beach Atlantic University, which is a great Christian university there in West Palm Beach. But um, the church historically didn't um, look like the community. So there were people who felt excluded, and that wasn't anybody's by anybody's design or, or intention of the heart, I don't think, but it just the way that it was, not only at that church, but at a lot of churches. A lot of churches. And so... One of the things that happened before I came, there's a guy named Keith Thomas who was a pastor there for 14 years in the 90s. And one of the things that Keith did was Keith kind of broke the color barrier, if you will. He kind of made it okay for people who weren't upper middle class, white, uh, Fox News Republicans to come to that church. And then what we did when we came is we've been able to accelerate that. And so we wanted to make our church look like our community. So we do have a multicultural church. We have a multi-generational church. And we have a multi-campus church. We have 13 campuses. Um, three of them speak Spanish. One of them speaks Portuguese. We have seed churches that speak uh, uh, Russian and other things, but uh, French, French Creole. But really, we just want to reach every neighborhood in South Florida with the gospel. And we think the way for us to do that is to put a neighborhood church in a neighborhood building with a neighborhood pastor who speaks the neighborhood language and try to reach every resident 
of every neighborhood in South Florida for Jesus. And so it's an aspirational goal because, you know, can we actually accomplish that? Well, I don't know, but I know we'll accomplish more if we try than if we don't. Yeah, you know, if 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 there are these different groups in your community. And they are. How, how can you not make it your goal to reach them? I don't know. I don't I don't either. I mean, this is the Great Commission. It's Yeah. You know, I I'll just confess, I have never believed in or liked homogeneous unit principle. Right. You know, you pick out the target group and you go after that target group. I've just I searched the New Testament in vain for this. Now I know people tend to congregate that way. Gentiles going to be with Gentiles and all that, but that's not the goal. No. I mean, and it's not what heaven's going to look like. And I think I want my church to look like my community. Right. I don't want us to look like a portion of our community, but the cross section of it. And you've done that extremely well. Now, here's the fascinating thing to me. Uh, West Palm Beach is, uh, is it, would, would you consider it an upscale town? I mean, well, it's funny because uh, it's I consider it's almost like a third world country. So you have the literally some of the the richest people in the world live right there. Right there, you can see Mar-a-Lago, Donald Trump's house, from the front porch of my church in our downtown campus. Okay, but we also have some of the poorest neighborhoods in all of North America in Palm Beach County. So uh, the truth is, there's a, a relatively few, you know, millionaires and billionaires. And there's a bunch of other people who live nearby. And so there's really everything. So if you come to our church, you'll, you will have millionaires and billionaires sitting next to people on public assistance right. and everything in between. Like I, I know, uh, I won't call any names, but I, like, I know some very famous CEOs. I mean, the kind of oh, yeah. guys that write autobiographies oh, yeah. uh, have uh, been at your church. Uh, like, and, uh, and yet you're reaching all kinds of demographic. Part of that resulted in uh you came up with an evangelistic method that southern baptists have used people in my church use it's called the three circles yeah uh, tell the story of how that came to be <laughs> well basically when i came to west palm beach uh our church was was really struggling they hadn't had a pastor in five years so they were financially struggling the facilities were out of date the the crowd wasn't very big and honestly the church skewed quite a bit older than it needed to to look like our community and so I wanted to connect with some younger people. We have Palm Beach Atlantic University right there nearby. And, you know, when I was at Southern Seminary with you, Herschel, Chris and I had a pretty big ministry with young moms, young families, nearlyweds and newlyweds. I mean, hundreds of people were involved in these things right. that we did. And I thought, oh, we'll just go we'll to just West Palm that. Beach and roll out our little, you know, road show, and we'll just connect with all these young couples. And so I put a little blurb in the bulletin. We're going to teach a class for people who want to get married. Um, uh, preparation for marriage class with Jimmy and Kristen Scroggins, limited to eight couples. It's $45 for the materials. And the class filled up in just a couple of days, just immediately filled up. Everybody paid. I thought, this is going to be great. I go in there and I figure out the people who signed up for the class, most of them didn't go to our church. Someone else that was connected with our church would sign these people up, their aunt, their mom, their brother. And it was a bunch of people from all different backgrounds. Most of them were in their 30s and 40s. Almost all of them were living together. None of them were in church. And there was only one couple like what I was picturing. There's a 23-year-old with his 22-year-old girlfriend who are about to graduate from PBA. They want to honor the Lord in yeah. marriage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, they're just trying so hard to wait for marriage, you know, to have sex. All these well, the rest of these people. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, man. So I went around and began to, to, to ask the people to tell me their story. And there was a, a girl there. Um, she, was a, she was an Anglo uh, about 30, she had two kids from two previous relationships. She'd never been married, visibly pregnant. Um, her 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 boyfriend, his name was Jorge, undocumented immigrant from Mexico. And at the time, he didn't speak any English, and she spoke no Spanish. And, wow. But they had been communicating because— Apparently. Yeah, so they, uh, they were in the class, and there was a girl named Priscilla sitting next to Jorge. And Priscilla was a Puerto Rican lady— about 32, beautiful girl, had an MBA, was a rising star in the banking world, was over about 30-something bank branches in South Florida. And she's Puerto Rican, but she'd been raised as a Buddhist in Puerto Rico and had never actually been inside a Christian church building until this meeting I'm describing. And she was visibly pregnant, had a daughter from a previous marriage. Her boyfriend, uh, Stanley, 
was a Jamaican guy, grew up in Jamaica. He ended up playing football in the NFL. He owned a cleaning business in South Florida. He had a son who he had adopted when his sister got murdered. And so she's visibly pregnant. And I'm just going around talking to these people. And Herschel, I just realized my Paul Tripp books and my gospel-centered principles that I was prepared to talk about were not going to work because these people didn't know any Bible stories. They didn't know any Bible verses. They weren't committed to the idea of marriage nor of the idea of Christianity. And so I said, I'm just there saying, can this help me? Yeah. They knew they're in a mess, but they want to have something. They have this, you know, God's grace is everybody has some kind of desire to put a family together and they're trying to figure this out. And so that week I stepped back and I said, okay, forget all the stuff I was going to talk about. How am I going to talk to these people about the gospel without doing a bait and switch? Because I told them I was going to talk about marriage. I need to make it about that. But how can I show them how the gospel will point them to marriage, which will address the brokenness that they're feeling? And I knew that I had to come up with a way that didn't require them to know a lot of verses and Bible stories for them to get it. And I asked God to show me, and I began to work on some things and basically develop the three circles that week in my office. And I came back. So the three circles really wasn't about evangelism exactly. It was about marriage. So I said, God has a design for marriage. Um, This is what it looks like, Genesis 1 and 2. But we want to do things our own way, so we think we can do it better. But every time we try to do it a different way, we end up in brokenness. And then we try to fix the brokenness by getting into a different relationship or coming to a class like this or whatever. Never fixes it. And what we figure out is, what we really need doesn't come from somewhere in here in our own lives, in our own hearts. It actually comes from somewhere else. It comes from the gospel. And so the gospel is what addresses the really fundamental problem that we have and the needs that we have. And that's Jesus crucified on the cross for our sins and raised from the dead. And if we will, the change that we need, we know we need to change. The brokenness knows something. We know something needs to change. The change that we need comes from him, not from us. And so we need to choose to repent. And the word repent fundamentally means change and repent and believe in the story of Jesus, invite him into our lives. And if we do, he'll forgive us. And then he'll begin to take us from wherever we are right now and begin to help us recover and pursue God's design for our marriage. So even if you've been promiscuous or had multiple relationships or divorced, you can't go back and fix your past. You know, right. God doesn't fix your past. That's right. But he does let you recover and pursue his design from right here, right now, the best you can. And so that message, I could just tell it was clicking with these people. And over the course, so I just changed my thing up a little bit. So I said, okay, instead of talking about communication the way I was going to, I'd say, let's just talk about three circles. God has a design for how men and women should communicate with one another. But we do it our own way and we mess it up. We end up in brokenness. And we want to change, but we really can't change for long. It doesn't go deep enough. The change we do ourselves, we need the gospel. God has a design for communication to help us recover. Let's talk about money. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about parenting. So all the things that you would talk about in marriage, I just use the three circles. Well, over the course of that eight weeks, um, (laughs) every single one of those couples, except the one I told you about was already Christians, all seven of them became Christians. All seven of them got married. And all seven of them got baptized. Now, I've never had anything happen like that before. That was a one-time, I don't know what happened, God moment. Mm -hmm. But it really happened. In fact, last Sunday, Ronald and Denisha, one of the couples in that class, came up and handed me their two babies and hugged my neck and just we just that that's that's twelve years ago. And there's you know, still in church. That that is the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel. That's what gets you up in the morning. Hey, I married Ronald and Denisha in the parking lot of our church. And they brought a whole, they, these, these guys are uh, a Caribbean. They brought a whole bunch of people out there dressed in full regalia. And it was so hot in the parking lot. My suit that I wore was, my pants were sticking to my legs like I jumped in the swimming pool. And I married them. I'll never forget it. Married them out there. And I just love seeing them at church on Sundays. They just yeah. come up. and It's glorious. Man. It's amazing. There's nothing like that in the world. You no. know, I mean, this, this is why I love being a pastor. That's why you stay somewhere. That's exactly right. And how long have you been at Family Church? Twelve years. Uh, and I've been at Buck Run sixteen. And, yeah. and the, the 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 joy after about year seven to nine, 
and something kicks in and yeah. it's just like, you know, what I've learned is you, you, you love the quirkiness. You love the, the weirdness and all that. I mean, these are your people. Yeah, and you just embrace it. <laughs> we have a phrase. We say some of these, we say some of these people are nuts, but there are nuts. That's right. <laughs> so we're that just glad right. to have them. Um, this was not the best segue, <clears throat> but you, you recently had a special guest. We did. Uh, at, for, at your Christmas program. We did. You got 15 minutes before the service began. You got a call. Yeah. What was it? All right. So we have, uh, so Christmas weekend this year, we had three services on Sunday, two on Monday and three on Tuesday at the downtown campus where I teach. Um, Tuesday being Christmas Eve. Right. So um, the last service was at six o'clock on Tuesday. And so at 545, some people approached me and said, hey, we're the advanced team for President Trump. And we would, uh, the president, the first lady would like to come to the six o'clock service. And so um, that was a little bit of a surprise. We really weren't prepared for that. But, of course, everybody's invited to come to church and hear right. the gospel of Jesus. Absolutely. And so, um, yeah, we said that will be great. Uh, did they ask for him to have a whole section? No, it's funny. So, what did they ask for? Yeah, so I said, okay, so let's let's talk about this for a second. I said, what's this going to mean to the people who are coming? Because we're going to have this place is going to be packed to the rafters, and there's going to be a 1,000 people in the room. Um, this will be standing room only. He said, well, look, we don't really need a lot. Um, we just need uh, th- six seats on rows three, four, and five right here in the middle. And right there by the aisle would be great. And I said, you want us to cordon them off or do you need like dogs guarding them? Or is it, oh, no, no, just 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 have somebody save the seats and he'll just come and sit down next to whoever. And uh, that's exactly what they did. He so came he just in, sat by somebody in your sat, church. sat next to a college kid. <laughs> that's neat. Yeah, that's the and your people reacted well. They did. So he showed up, and and uh, uh, your church is not monolithic. I mean, you, no, you, I would say we're at least thirty or forty percent Democratic leaning voters. Yeah, I mean, and South so, Florida, and, and if you reach, it's very diverse, and so yeah, there's right. a lot of immigrants, um, and so um, there's a lot of African Americans, and 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 so I will just tell you, there are people in our church who who and and there's plenty of Anglo's in our church who are uh, not pleased that he is the president. Yeah, and so. Uh, but when he came in the room, our church did the right thing, which you should do, which is they they clapped and uh, stood for the president. Uh, we didn't ask them to. They just did it spontaneously. Yeah. Um, and I believe they would have done the same thing if it were any president, if it were President Obama or President Clinton or President Bush. I think uh, the same thing appropriate. would have happened. I mean, this is what Paul said this when Nero was the, was the Caesar. So, you know, honor the king. And so he came in, sat down, and we just had church. So we didn't do anything special for him. We didn't. Um, obviously, we didn't have to acknowledge that he was in the room. I mean, he was in the room. And we just sang the songs and preached the gospel. And one thing I requested, um, I said, look, if they're going to come, I need them to be here close to the beginning of the service, and I need them to stay through the end. If they're planning on leaving before it's over, I'd rather them not come. And um, and they said, no, no, he'll stay to the end, which he did. And and uh, they, they actually said, and, and Pastor, we really – have no expectation that you would recognize him or have him stand or have him come onto the platform in any way. And of course that was not, that would not have been appropriate. Right. And I said, uh, okay, that, you know, I easily agreed to that, but uh, look, I was glad that he came. I was glad to meet him. I've never met a president before. Um, our church was glad that he came and he was very, he and he and the first lady were very engaged the whole time. They sang all the songs, they clapped, they laughed, they listened to the message um, they were very thankful and complimentary and gracious afterwards, and then they went to dinner. And so, it really was a. To be honest with you, it was a, it was a very good experience. I think for our church, um, and it's a great opportunity to preach the gospel. You preach the gospel. I, I saw on Twitter, you know, that that night it went up, and different news organizations reporting. You know, it was Christmas Eve. I saw so many people who know you because of your reputation as a man of the gospel. They said. Thank God we know the president is hearing a clear gospel tonight. And hallelujah. You know, apart from any judgment on the president's spiritual condition, the gospel is always good. Amen. Believers, unbelievers need to hear the gospel. And everybody knew that they were going to hear it that night, as did everyone else that was there. That's right. And, you know, the president's an important person in the world, of course. But the truth is uh, hundreds of people that go to our church brought their neighbor brought their friend, brought their dad, brought got, right. talked their son into yeah. coming to church just this one night. And for them to hear the gospel 
is just as important as for Donald Trump Absolutely. to hear the gospel. They're all image bearers of God. That's they all right. have an eternal soul. And, and so it wasn't really about him. Uh-huh. It was really about Jesus. And um, we really in, encourage people to invite their friends, family, get them to come to Christmas Eve because people will come on Christmas Eve with you. Yeah. And so we just tried to make sure it wasn't about him. It's about Jesus and about all the people in the room. Yeah, it, it's a it's a great opportunity, and and I thank God that uh, you took it. It, it. I think it was a grace that you didn't know much ahead of time, don't you? Oh, no question. You know, this way it, it, you just did what you were going to do. You didn't that's have right. time to think. Do we need to adjust? You nope. just did it. That's right. And I think that's great. Well, I like to end uh, with a twinkling of an eye around. Just a few quick questions, okay. and and uh, not, again, not trying to trip you up. Just want to know know you a little bit, okay? Uh, so. Uh, what two or three preachers have influenced you the most? Um, probably you and uh, Jerry Vines and then Spurgeon. Okay, man, I, the, you know, that's blasphemy right there, putting me in, in the same sentence with those two guys. But thank you. Uh, what books have influenced you the most? Um, I like to read Francis Schaeffer. So Francis Schaeffer and the God Who Is There really pressed on me when I was in seminary. Uh, it's one of the books Al told me to read. And it really pressed on me that there are good philosophical and theological and intellectual um, options for Christians. And one of the things that Francis Schaeffer said is that Christians don't have to um, Christians don't have to destroy every argument against us. We just have to present a credible alternative, an alternative that is more credible than the other alternatives mm-hmm. that are out there. Boy, that freed me up intellectually personally and in conversations with others. So Francis Schaeffer's probably my favorite. There's a, there's a, there's another book, um, uh, about, about Paul's prayers and, uh, this guy, I'm, I'm having a, a brain blur, but this guy, he wrote about prayer. And I read this book about six times in seminary that had to do with the prayers of Paul and just the way that Paul prayed affectionately for people. And so I love that. And then honestly, the book, good to great, no. I know that's not spiritual enough for a lot of people, no. but the book Good to Great um, by Jim Collins affects me deeply because I think Jim Collins describes a lot of, he, he's, he's tangential to the Bible. It's, it's, right. it's, it's uncovering a lot of um, biblical principles about love and leadership that I really value. Uh, do you have a hobby? No. I used to play golf, but my hobby at this point is my kids' sporting activities. So... I bet that keeps you busy. It keeps me really, really busy. That's all I have time yeah. to do. Do you have a favorite vacation spot? Mm, you know, I really like to go to the beach. The beach is my favorite. It doesn't matter where it is. So um, when we when you're taking around eight kids or then their friends and their girlfriends and whoever else, or daughters-in-law that are with you, uh, we normally don't fly. So we're going to drive. So we have a place we like to go near St. Augustine where we go to the beach. Uh so if you and Kristen could go anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? Probably New York City. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, I hope you get that opportunity. Yeah. I'm especially glad that you got to be here today. I just want to say thank you. I, I want you to know, man, I'm a fan. I cheer you on. I've seen you in uh, so many different venues, and you just are always a, a gospel-centered person. You're fun. Uh, I love you very much, and I just want to say thanks for being with me on Pastor Well today. Well, it's an honor to be here, and Herschel, you know my great affection for you and for Tanya and for your sons, and just the tremendous influence and life-on-life kind of impression that you have made on Kristen and me. And so every time I preach or baptize, and really what we do with our family, um, there's always a little bit of Herschel and Tanya that are reflected in that. So thank you. Well, thank uh, Nothing could encourage me and bless me more than that. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored uh, to hear you say that. Uh, so I want to say thanks to all of you who watched today on Pastor Well. This is the last episode in Season 2. There will be a little bit of a hiatus, so watch for Season 3 to begin soon. And we'll see you again next time on Pastor Well.